Father, we thank you for giving to us your holy word. We thank you for its unerring ability to take us from Egypt to Canaan. We thank you that it's a lamp and a light unto our feet and path. Today, Father, we honor you and praise you for not leaving us in this world without your word. Thank you for hearing and being with us today. In Jesus' name, amen. In John's Gospel, chapter 17 and verse 17, Jesus prayed that his disciples might be sanctified through what? The Word, the truth. And he referred to this Word as the truth. The truth. Do you realize that more than half of the American people who have been polled recently believe there is no such thing as absolute truth? That doesn't shock you. Perhaps many of us assume that as high as 67% of this nation no longer believe in absolute truth, that every man is subject to interpret it according to his own understanding. I'm glad, beloved, that God has given us His Word, which is truth. And may I suggest that this is absolute truth. In the great principles that God has given to us, they're unchangeable. And it represents truth. The prophet Amos tells us in chapter 3 and verse 7 how God reveals His truth, the truth of His Word to His people. He says, Surely the Lord God will do nothing without revealing His secret unto His servants, the prophets. So God then always reveals to His prophets what is important for His people. These revelations of the prophets can be found in the book that I've held up to you this morning, the Bible, the Holy Scriptures. As Christians, we believe that these 66 books found within the cover of your Bible and mine, are holy because they represent the Word of God. From our opening scriptural text that Dr. Gary read for us this morning, we find a warning that God has given through His prophet, recorded in His Word, to John the Revelator. If any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life, and out of the holy city, and from the things which are written in this book. Revelation 22, verse 19. And by the way, there's a whole sermon right in that one little verse alone. There are many people today that believe that once you're saved, you're always saved. You can't be lost. Jesus said as He closes the last chapter of His book, Behold, if you alter, change, take out, add to this book, your name will be taken out of the Lamb's book of life, which shows that those who have been put in may not always stay in. What God asked John to write was recorded for our understanding and edification, beloved. It was never to be altered. It was never to be added to or taken from. That which has gone out of God's mouth is unchangeable, I'm suggesting to you this morning, just as the psalmist said in Psalm 119, verse 89, Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Forever, beloved, is a long, long time. As we study the word of God, we find it to be a book of current history. Now, I realize there are those today that disbelieve the Word of God and believe that it is not an accurate book of any history, past, present, or future. I happen to disagree. Well, who am I? I am a child of God. And I thank God that I can speak for Jesus today and I can declare to the world that God said it. I believe it. And that's enough for me. As we study the Word of God, we find it to be not only a book of current history, but it also reveals the presence of the I Am, who is ever-present with His people in every generation. This is more, beloved, than just a book. It represents the very presence 
of God in the 1990s. When God recorded this last book in the New Testament, He was told, Seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. And yet today I hear people say that the book of Revelation is a closed book. It's a book of mystery. It's a book you can't understand. Why would God say to seal it not then? Because the time is at hand. God wanted to warn His people. And He does nothing without revealing His secrets to His servants, the prophets, that we as a people, common people, might understand His will. Revelation 22.10 Seal not the sayings of the book. It was around 96 A.D., that most commentators, or many of them, conclude that John recorded these last revelations of Jesus Christ to his church. But the revelations or revealings did not end with the early church, for they have continued to guide God's chosen people right into the 1990s. And beloved, until the curse of sin has been blotted from the earth, and every tear has been wiped away, And God's eternal kingdom finally set up. The book of Revelation will continue to be relevant to you and me. Today I want to share with you what the Word of God has revealed about the spiritual unification of the three powers that are presently uniting our world together, leading us toward the final battle of Armageddon, as recorded in Revelation 16, verse 13. In other words, let me say that big paragraph again. In other words, I want to talk about the unification factor of the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. What unites them? That's what I want to talk about today according to God's Word. I'm going to take time this morning to do a major... I'm not going to take time to do a major study on the background and identification of these three powers that I've just mentioned because I assume that as Bible students, you're already aware of the powers that they represent. However, in passing, let me just mention them to refresh your memory. The dragon is Satan, the devil, according to Revelation 12, 9. The beast is the great papal power of Rome, according to Revelation 13, verses 1 through 8 and identified by the great reformers of that church and recorded in history and is evident even today. The false prophet is America, your country and mine, who has silenced her prophetic voice against the great church of Rome and as a result has lost her protest and become a apostate Protestant nation. According to Revelation 13, 11 through 17, we have fulfilled and are fulfilling that very prediction by God to his prophet. In the book of Revelation, now John sees these three powers I've just identified uniting in a final battle against God. There's Satan uniting his forces of the supernatural with Roman Catholicism who in turn is joining hands with apostate Protestantism. You see, beloved, what I'm sharing this morning, I don't want anybody to be offended because it almost takes in everybody in the globe. You see, I'm a Protestant. You may be Catholic this morning, or those listening to the tape may be Catholic this morning. It doesn't matter, beloved. If we're lost, it doesn't matter what organization we belong to. And if apostate Protestantism involves me, and Roman Catholicism involves you, and we are united together under a false spirit of spiritualism, then, beloved, we need to get out of it. Now, with these thoughts in mind, let's begin our study by asking a simple question. What symbol does God use in Revelation 16, 13? You have your Bibles. Take a look at it. What symbol does God use in Revelation 16, 13 to describe the unclean spirits that come from these three powers? Revelation 16, 13. Would you help me on that question? What symbol does God use? Good. Frogs. John says, and I saw three unclean spirits like frogs. Now, in Exodus chapter 8, you don't need to turn there, but just think of 
with it with me for a moment. In Exodus chapter 8, we find the land of Egypt being overrun with a little creature called frogs. Just prior, catch this little note, just prior to God's people being miraculously delivered. Oh, I like that. That was worth your coming today. In Psalm 105, verse 30, we read that their land, Egypt, brought forth frogs in abundance. And then it says, in the chambers of their kings. Frogs in the chambers of their kings. Only in Exodus chapter 8 and in the Psalms, and then again in Revelation 16, do we find the word frog in the Bible. It's the only place it talks about frogs. In the Old Testament, the frogs were a plague upon the people. The people had no control over the frogs. Even their great leaders were under their power. As it was, I'm suggesting this morning, so shall it be. Only this time in Revelation, we find the symbol of frogs being used for unclean spirits. In other words, a plague of unclean spirits will come upon the land and the people will have no control over them. Even their great leaders will be under their power. And all of this will be happening just prior to God's people being miraculously delivered for the very last time. And if I could convince you this morning that the frogs are hopping about, wouldn't you be excited to know that Jesus is about to come to deliver his people? I'm going to try to do that very thing. Because, beloved, I believe with all my heart that we are seeing the beginning of the signs of the unification of these three powers of Revelation. Now, I want you to notice something rather interesting here as you have your Bible open there to Revelation 16. God uses the symbol of frogs there to indicate unclean spirits. Do you notice that? But now notice where they come from. They come out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet. This, I'm suggesting this morning, is a very clear indication of a type of spirit that we can expect to see in the last days. According to Revelation, this unclean spirit has three identifying marks. Number one, it's a spirit that is common to each of the three powers that unite. Number two, it is a spirit that comes forth from their mouths. And number three, it is a spirit that is symbolized by a frog. Now, by asking some basic, simple questions, we can discover some other important points that I believe will make God's Word come alive with some relevance in the 1990s. Do you want to know what those questions are? Let's ask them. First, what do these unclean spirits, like frogs, do, according to verse 14? What did they do? If you have your Bible open, turn and follow along as I read. Revelation 16, verse 14. For they are the spirits of devils, working miracles, which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to do something. What do they do? To gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. Question one, then. What do these frog-like spirits do? They go out to gather, in other words, to bring together the rest of the entire world. Do you see it there? They go out to gather the world to themselves. In other words, they must be a very extremely aggressive spirits. They must be very aggressive spirits. Does that make sense? 
Because they have an extreme desire for unification. They want to unite the world under their power. Do you see that? Am I, am I with you? Are you with me? Question two. What does the word gather mean in the Greek? And you can look this up if you have a Greek lexicon. If you have access to this, look it up for yourself. Study this out. Question two. What does the word gather mean in the Greek? The word gather, which the frog-like spirits do, is soon ago. Soon ago. A word denoting union. Union. It means, in other words, now listen to these descriptions. They're very classic. It means to attach to oneself. To lead by laying hold of, or to take in, to draw together as a net in which fish are caught. To join as one those who have once been separated. That's what the word means together. To bring them in. To unite them. To cap, capture them. Do you see that? This is significant. This leads me to ask another question. Does the frog-like spirit, here in Revelation 16, use a frog-like quality in gathering its prey? Let me explain what I mean. If frogs gather their prey by laying hold of it with their tongue and attaching themselves to it and taking it in, could it be that the frog-like spirit will also gather its prey by the use of its tongue and thus join as one those who have been previously separated? Are you with me? I want you to listen carefully to what I'm about to share with you this morning. And even though I apologize somewhat this morning that I have not given you a biblical background yet, I just don't have enough Sabbaths in a week to preach everything that I need to preach. So I apologize that I haven't given you yet a biblical background on the issue that I'm about to address. But I feel in spite of that, We need to move ahead and identify what is happening and where we are according to the Word of God in the 1990s. So some of you may not have a good background on what I'm going to suggest to you this morning. But let me just say this. By God's grace, I plan to present a message in the next few weeks, I hope, that will give you the biblical, historical, and scientific information that has led me to seriously consider the conclusions that I'm about to share with you this morning. So what I'm sharing is just not a hunch. It's not just a good idea. It's based on biblical, historical, and scientific evidence that I will share with you. I promise. Just keep coming and don't quit. All right? Now, let's launch into what I'd like to share with you. In light of what we've shared so far, in the mid-1960s, at Notre Dame University, a strange prophetic utterance came forth from a number of Roman Catholics, priests and nuns, who were engaged in prayer to the Virgin Mary. This was the beginning of the charismatic movement that has since flooded the Roman Catholic Church. Today, about 10 million Catholics in America and over 70 million in 163 countries of the world speak in tongues. This strange utterance of the Spirit, which has come forth from the mouths of men and women, has been identified by the public press as the unifying factor between Catholics and Protestants. Now please think with me in what we've shared already. I want you to understand the significance of what I've just said. The public press has identified the beginning of the unification that will eventually unite the world on the side of Satan. I'm not saying this, beloved. The public press is saying this. The rocks are crying out, beloved, that it's time to get ready because Jesus is about to come. (coughs) 
the final movements I'm suggesting this morning for setting up the kingdom of darkness in opposition to the kingdom of light has already begun. As strange as it may seem, charismatics, now follow this, charismatics were the first to hold conferences with both Protestant and Catholics as they came together to accept each other as Christians. It was under the charismatic renewal movement that allowed Catholics and Protestants to come together. Are you thinking with me this morning? This is a point. I'm suggesting this morning that according to Revelation 16 must not be overlooked. The unclean spirits which the Word of God declared would one day come out of the mouths of both Catholics and Protestants to unite them under the force of the dragon would come forth in the last day. Today, these unclean spirits are manifesting themselves before the world. And beloved, the Word of God is being fulfilled to the very letter. Listen to this statement by David Briggs of the Associated Press, March 30, 1994. The title of the article is, Religious Rivals Extend Olive Branch. The subtitle is just as revealing. Catholic and evangelical leaders vow to join in a common bond to work towards shared values. Now listen to this statement from the Associated Press in the article, In Light of Prophecy. I'm quoting, and think of John and Revelation. What has brought the two communities to this point are the experiences of worshiping together in the charismatic movement and working together in political causes such as the anti-abortion movement, end quote. The unclean spirits, like frogs, I'm suggesting, have already begun to speak from the mouth of the beast and the false prophet. The reasoning behind the unification is simple. Listen to this. If Protestants speak in tongues, and believe it to be the Holy Spirit, then how can they refuse fellowship with Catholics who speak with the same tongue? Are they not one in the Spirit? God cannot be divided. It must be His desire, His prayer, that we all be one. I'd have to agree, what I see today is one. They are one in the Spirit. But I'm asking a question. Which Spirit? According to Revelation, they are one in Spirit, but Revelation calls them an unclean Spirit that unites them. You see, beloved, the clean Spirit cannot unite Roman Catholicism with apostate or with Protestantism, let me put it that way. Spiritual Protestantism. God can unite darkness with light. If there was ever a time to take the Word of God seriously and listen to God's counsel through Paul, I believe it is this morning, today, quench not the Spirit, he writes, Despise not prophesying, but notice the next sentence. Prove all things and hold fast that which is good. Just because you speak in tongues, just because you've been slain in the Spirit, just because you work miracles, just because you do great, strange things, doesn't mean you're of God. Satan will bring down fire from heaven in the sight of men. Satan works miracles too. Remember there were false frogs that the magicians of Egypt also called forth. God gave the same warning again that Paul gave there in 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 19 through 21. God gave the same warning through John in his first epistle, chapter 4 and verse 1. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits. Test them, in other words, whether they're of God, because many false prophets are gone out in the world. Is that good advice? 
The Word of God has given many tests, beloved, for testing the spirits. One of the best that I know of is an old familiar passage to all of us, Isaiah 8, verses 19 through 20. And when the people, instead of putting their trust in God, shall say to you, consult the directions, or excuse me, consult for direction mediums and wizards who chirp and mutter, should not a people seek and consult their God? Should they not consult, excuse me, should they consult the dead on behalf of the living? Obviously not. To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is what? No light in them. How much light? No light in them. Beloved, we need to remember the words of Revelation, that the unclean spirits will work miracles and do wonders and gather the whole world together. But unity is not necessarily a sign of God's blessing either. Did you know that? For what fellowship hath light with darkness? Can two walk together except they be agreed? We need to remember that Protestants came into existence as a result of their breaking away from the great church of Rome. She was the mother, they were the children. Revelation 17, read it sometime. It talks again about the great mother who lost her children. But then God defines the mother as a mother of harlots. Again, I'm reminding us this morning that Protestants came into existence as a result of their breaking away from the mother church. They came out of Catholicism because of their bold and unyielding stand for the word of God. In other words, they broke away from tradition and superstition and paganism. Protestants today, however, need to remember that the Roman church has never held the Bible as the infallible Word of God. Never. Not even from its first day of inception. If that shocks you, let me read just two quotes from their own pen from a Roman Catholic book with a foreword by John F. Noel, Archbishop and Bishop of Fort Wayne, entitled, Finding Christ Church with Maps to Show the Way. I read on page 18 the following, and I quote, Great as is our reverence for the Bible, reason and experience compel us to say that it alone is not a competent nor a safe guide as to what we are to believe. A competent guide for the Christian, religion must possess these three qualifications. Number one, it must be within the reach of every inquirer after truth. Number two, it must be clear and intelligible to all. Number three, it must present all the truths of the Christian religion. The Bible, however, possesses none of these qualifications. In quote. From another book entitled The Faith of Our Fathers by James Cardinal Gibbons, former Archbishop of Baltimore, page 89, I read this and I quote, the scriptures alone cannot be a sufficient guide and rule of faith because they cannot at any time be within the reach of every inquirer. Because they are not of themselves clear and intelligible even in matters of the highest importance. Beloved, if we can't trust this, what can we trust? Rome says trust the church and her traditions and the priest to see you through. I'm glad, beloved, that I have a great high priest that I can go to who's Jesus Christ today. When you and I see Protestants, Catholics, and spiritualists all beginning to unite on what they call common ground, there should be no doubt in your mind or mine that this unity is not of God but is the predicted coming together of unification of the three frogs of Revelation 16. Are you with me? When we see these things happen, we should know, according to God's word, that it's being fulfilled exactly what he said. I know there are those who will argue this fact of what I've just said and will raise the claim that Catholics are Christians and are not spiritualists. There are many who would like to believe that Rome has nothing to do with Satan worship, but beloved, the evidence is not on their side. I would like to say, however, let me add this. Please hear me. 
I would like to say that I believe that there are scores of good, well-meaning Catholics who are ignorantly worshipping within a system that is rooted in paganism and don't know it. The last baptism I had in Pennsylvania was a beautiful Catholic brother studying for the priesthood for many years. Praise God, God has a lot of good Catholics who are willing to burn through the fires of purgatory in order to get cleansed to go to heaven. Beloved, that's a greater desire than many of us as Christians have. The first baptism we had here, we baptized a Catholic. Praise God for Catholics. So there are many who, again, I'm saying, are, have worshipped Rome and, and Rome's teachings and dogmas and creeds and ignorance. And according to God's word, in this time of their ignorance, God winks at their sin. Praise God. Acts records it. But the day is coming, beloved, when they will have to come out of her. According to Revelation 14, they will have to come out of her and disassociate themselves completely with Catholicism. Or remain and be joined to her in her final destruction as outlined in Revelation 17, verse 16. So in these final hours of earth's history, the great church of Rome is taking advantage of our Protestant ignorance. And while seeking to unite with us on common points of moral interest, she has broken down the doors of resistance. We have forgotten why we're Protestants today. Protestants in the 1990s no longer see Rome as their forefathers once did. Patricia O'Connell Killen, professor of American religion at Pacific Lutheran University in Tacoma, summed it up well in the Oregonian of August 26, 1995, when she was quoted by the Oregonian as saying, it's surprising to see groups that have identified Roman Catholicism as an evil if not satanic force, now wanting to cooperate with that church on issues of personal morality. End quote. Many fundamental Protestants were shocked when evangelist Billy Graham was quoted as saying, I have found that my beliefs are essentially the same as those of Orthodox Roman Catholics. End quote. But he's not alone. Paul Coach on the Trinity Broadcasting Network said, I'm eradicating the word protestant even out of my vocabulary. I'm not protesting anything. It's time for Catholics and non-Catholics to come together as one in the Spirit and one in the Lord. End quote. And the influential Robert Schuller has stated, it's time for Protestants to go to the shepherd or the pope and say, what do we have to do to come home? In quote. At the beginning of this decade, on March 2 through 4, Pastor Schuler hosted the charismatic Catholic-sponsored 6th Annual West Coast Conference on the Holy Spirit at his Crystal Cathedral. He also delighted his audience, most of whom were Roman Catholics, when he told them that he had asked the Holy Father to bless his cathedral. And on the 30th anniversary of his ministry, the Holy Father bestowed his apostolic blessing upon Robert Schuller's ministry. That reminds me of the testimony of a Baptist leader who signed the historic document just a few months ago entitled Evangelicals and Catholics Together. This Baptist was honored. Please note, this Baptist was honored that this document finally granted evangelicals recognition by Catholics as a legitimate religious group. Beloved, do you understand that thinking? The thinking. It would be like the priests of Baal accepting Elijah the prophet as a legitimate religious leader and Elijah feeling good about the recognition. How could a Baptist, how could a Baptist say, I'm so glad that we're recognized by Rome as being legitimate? Why? 
Where is Protestant America hidden in the 1990s? Can you see it? Perhaps you read about the group of some 60 persons who began meeting last fall in Seattle's east side. They came together to form a Washington State affiliate of the National Interfaith Alliance. Their group consisted of Catholics, Lutherans, Methodists, Disciples of Christ, Episcopalians, Presbyterians, Congregationalists, Unitarians, Muslims, Jews, and Buddhists. The members of the Alliance say, quote, We have to be tolerant and rational about our beliefs toward one another. That is what it is to be an American, end quote. Protestant America lost her protest, has become apostate Protestantism. Yes, beloved, we have. This strange unification of Protestant America with Catholics, Muslims, and Buddhists is not the only place such alliances have been going on. Pope John Paul II gathered in Assisi, Italy, back in 1986 with 130 leaders representing the world's 12 major religions to unite with them in prayer for world peace. Now think with me. His prayer partners included snake worshippers, fire worshippers, spiritists, animists or pantheists who believe that God is in the spirit of the rock and the tree. North American witch doctors, Buddhists, Muslims and Hindus, as well as so-called Christians and Catholics. That's who he prayed with for world peace. The Pope declared that all were praying to the same God, quote, end quote. The Pope, on that same occasion, allowed his good friend, the Dalai Lama, to remove the cross from the altar and place Buddha on it so that his monks could perform their worship in St. Peter's Church in Assisi. You see, beloved, removing one pagan symbol to put another in its place is no problem for pagan worshipers. But it is a problem for those who want to worship the true God. In Christianity, there is only one God. He is not Allah. And there can be no fellowship between the gods of this world and the Creator God who made this world. When I see the major movements taking place in America today, I can't help but rejoice because I know that Jesus' coming is near. The powers of Revelation 16 are moving toward each other with a rapidity that takes one's breath away. And what the religions of this world have failed to understand is that the Pope, that Pope John Paul's encyclical on Christian unity, which he issued last May, made it very clear. We have failed to realize that through the Pope's eyes, they will not compromise. His encyclical stated that any union with Protestants will happen essentially on Vatican terms, with the Pope remaining the prime authority on the Christian faith, end quote. In light of such boldness, the World Council of Churches warmly welcomed the Pope's letter, saying that it demonstrates a strong commitment to ecumenism by the Pope. In the United States, the General Secretary of the National Council of Churches called the encyclical a testament to the very spirit of Christian unity which we seek. End quote. Today I see million, a million man march. I see a million man march on Washington, D.C. Organized by the Muslim leader of Islam in the United States of America. Men saying, we're not following a man. We are just coming together because we have common interest. I see 125,000 men and women at a so-called holy mass 
in New York. Some say, we're not following a man, we're just following common interests. I see an ex-university football coach with a Catholic background who's become a member of the Charismatic Vineyard Church, leading 700,000 men together in unity this summer, filling 13 football stadiums across America to unite men to take common responsibility. No, we're not following a man. We're not part of an ecumenical movement. We're just coming together because we have some things in common. And I ask again, what fellowship have light with darkness? When I go back and take a look at who the powers are through which the Spirit is speaking, beloved, I choose not to be a part of the power. I see their plan to march on Washington with a million men in 1997. And today, while many of us as Adventists are losing our youth because of our apparent lack of interest in the church, the promise keepers are keeping their promise and are organizing the youth of this nation into a united army for Jesus Christ. And I dare say that many Seventh-day Adventists will get sucked into it, drawn into it, captivated by it, and the frog with his tongue will take them captive. No wonder Pat Robertson told the participants in the 17th Pentecostal World Conference in, in Jerusalem that the next five years, the last of this decade, will be a spiritual harvest of unprecedented magnitude. Why? Beloved, there is something happening in the world today. There is a charismatic renewal movement, and it's at the grassroots, from the grassroots up, and also from up moving down. There are three frogs hopping, as it were, all over this world today, uniting Protestantism, Catholicism, and Spiritualism in all of its forms of Hinduism and Buddhism and all of the others. They're uniting together. Revelation said we would see that time come. Beloved, we've entered what I believe is going to become the greatest religious revival of all time. But according to the Word of God, its roots are coming out of those three powers we've talked about this morning that are moving by unclean spirits like frogs. In the future, we're going to see two things happen. I'd like to share those two with you in closing. Good news, bad news. Which do you want for first? Let's have a little good and then go to bad and end on good. How's that? The good news is that before the final visitation of God's judgment upon the earth, that means before Revelation 16 and the great seven last plagues, before the final last plagues of God's judgment upon the earth, there will be among the people of the Lord such a revival of primitive godliness as has not been witnessed since the days of the apostles. That thrills my heart. God will revive His church at last. The world will recognize that God is alive, that He's real. And you can't deny Him anymore. The Spirit and power of God will be poured out upon His children. At that time, more good news. At that time, many, what did I say? Many will separate themselves from those churches in which the love of this world has supplanted love for God and for His Word. You see what's happening today in the great Promise Keepers movement and what's happening today in the great marches on Washington, D.C. and what's happening in the great religious movements that are coming together with a common cause. Out of those movements, God will call His remnant people and thousands will hear His voice and respond. Not just people. Listen to what I'm told under inspiration. Many both of ministers and people will gladly accept those great truths which God has caused to be proclaimed at this time to prepare a people for the Lord's second coming. That thrills my heart, beloved. This last week I was thrilled as I listened to a man by the name of Pat Robertson. A caller called him and asked, Could you please tell us about those last seven years of earth's history in the tribulation and the rapture, etc., etc.? And I just sat there and said, Oh Lord, save your people. Because the whole rapture came out of the Roman Catholic Church to lift the stigma off of itself as being the Antichrist of biblical prophecy and change biblical prophecy in order to identify herself as being God's true church and everyone who left her as false brethren. I know the background of all of that. And I was sitting there allowing all of these thoughts to go through my mind when the Lord thrilled my heart. 
What did he do? Pat Robertson very calmly said, Sister, you have to understand that Schofield's Bible has footnotes that we cannot trust. That the concept of the seven last years and the rapture really are not biblically based. I said, wait a minute. Lord, this is Pat Robertson. Now, I'm not saying that Pat Robertson understands everything that I understand, nor do I understand everything he does. But beloved, a text, a thought came back to my mind that God has people out there that will hear his voice in the last remnant of time and come out of her. And even ministers and people will gladly accept those great truths which God is having caused to be given at that time. That's the good news, beloved. God is about to rule and overrule. He's about to take the reins into his own hand and do a work that none of us have ever imagined possible. My encouragement to you and me this morning is to stay faithful. Hang on. Hold on. Don't give up. Don't leave the ship. Stay aboard, beloved, because the best years ahead for this church are just around the corner. Now, the bad news. The enemy of souls desires to hinder this last work of Christ. And just before the time for such a movement to come, he, Satan, will endeavor to prevent it, stop it, by introducing a counterfeit movement. What comes first, the genuine or the false? According to this, the false precedes the genuine. So whatever happens that's exciting, that unites the worlds together, the world together, you know is not of God, has to be of Satan, because Satan takes the field first to draw the world after him. And then God comes at the last remnant of time and says, This is the way, walk ye in it. Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sin or of her plagues that are soon to fall. And thousands come out. But see, beloved, first they have to get in. And they're in confusion. That's the word for Babylon. And so the thousands, the millions today are uniting together in a false religious revival. And it's going to continue to merge and grow. Watch for it. You'll see it grow. But one day soon, in spite of the false that is today preceding the genuine, one day soon God will pour out His Spirit upon His church. In the meantime... In those churches which Satan can bring under his deceptive power, he will make it appear that God's special blessing is poured out. There will even be manifest what is thought to be great religious interest. Multitudes will exalt that God is working marvelously for them when the work is that of another spirit. It's an unclean spirit. It's a fraud of Revelation 16, 13. She concludes in Great Controversy 464, Under a religious guise, Satan will seek to extend his influence over the entire Christian world. Beloved, what I'm saying this morning is that you and I have the privilege of being distinct, peculiar, holy, and special as God's chosen ambassadors for a last message, a last call for a last generation of people. Don't give up. Hold on, beloved. Watch the faults move, but be assured that God's word is true and the falling away will take place. God will have his true people who will come out of what we see today. And beloved, you and I can play a part in calling them out. Listen to me. But not if you and I are a part of them. You can't call people out of that which you've joined. Therefore, I suggest, beloved, let us pray for our Baptists, our Catholic friends. Let us pray for those in these other faiths that today are at least coming together for a common cause. Pray for them because they don't see what you and I see. But the honest in heart, when God's message finally goes, will touch their heart and they will come out. And they will join with you and me. And we can go through to the kingdom of God. That's good news. Be faithful, beloved. Jesus is coming again. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for your word. Thank you for the assurance that we have that you live, that you move, 
and that you've even chosen to have your being in us, that you've come down and touched the heart of man is what I'm saying this morning. Thank you, Father, for sending your Spirit to lead us into all truth, to teach us your word, to show us your way. May we be faithful as Christians. In Jesus' name, amen. You have been listening to another special American Christian Ministries presentation. This recording has been digitally reprocessed from the original audio cassette or reel-to-reel in order to make this CD available. The audio quality was improved as much as possible. International copyright, American Christian Ministries. All rights reserved. To order a copy of this or other presentations or for a free catalog, please call toll-free 800-233-4450. International calls dial 717-652-7000. You may also order from our secure website at www.americanchristianministries.org. There you will discover the largest selection of authentic Adventist preaching available. American Christian Ministries is not a one-man band. It is an orchestra of outstanding speakers who are all on the same theological page. If American Christian Ministries has been a blessing to you, why not take a moment just now and send us a note or an email with your testimony? We'll share it with our speakers and volunteer workers to encourage them. Your prayers and continued financial support are very important to ensure the continuation of this ministry as we help prepare America and the world to meet Jesus Christ. He's coming soon.